a new you, a new you. I think Peter's unpacking for us here in chapter four what it looks like to be the new you. And I thought, well, what, what, what a great opportunity to study this uh, topic as we kind of come to the end of the year and take stock of, of our relationships and our circumstances and our place in life where we find ourselves today. And then if you're like me, you start getting a little sentimental and looking at pictures on Facebook and on your phone and looking at journal entries and looking at your daytimer or your calendar and l- reflecting on the year. And as you, as you take stock of, of where you've been, you, you, you start thinking about where you're going, where you want to go, where you intend to go, where you hope not to go. And so as we end the new year reflecting on all God has done and all all we've done and things we are uh, uh, that's happened to us maybe this year, and then begin thinking f- uh, forward to where we want to go this year. It, I think it's it's apropos that Peter will give us a word about what it means to be to live out the new you here in the new year. So, if you got your Bibles, chapter four, verse one, we're going to read just the whole passage and then we'll walk through and pull out a few things he's telling us to, to think about here. Therefore, verse one. Since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in in regard to the spirit. Verse seven, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A couple of things here that God gives us that are part of the new you we see here in the text. Number one, we see that God gives us new desires. Okay, so this is for those who are in Christ. If you're here and a follower of Jesus Christ, one of the, the roles of the minister of the gospel is to tell you who you are and to remind you what God's done in you and what God's done for you, and what he desires to do through you. If you're here, and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're checking some things out, or you know, your life fell apart this week, so that, well, shoot, you know, my job's not working, I'll try church. If you're here, let me un- unpack for you what happens when you give your life to Jesus. What happens when you surrender, you wave the, the white flag, and, and you, you come to the, to the Father, and you say, you know what, the functional saviors I've been looking to for identity, and worth, and value, and, and, and substance and meaning and purpose. The heavens I've been pursuing here on earth aren't working. I've been trying to avoid the hells of financial, you know, uh, 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 financial tragedy or, or relational dysfunction. And those are my versions of hell here on earth. And I look to functional saviors to fix me from those things, and they're not rescuing me. And, and I'm done trying to save myself. I'm going to look to you now and your Savior, and He offers you Jesus Christ. And you confess your sins, you repent of your sins, and you place your faith not in other people or your own work, but Jesus. In that moment, Moment, you're transformed, okay? And it's, it, it's called the rebirth. You, you, you're, you're born again, the Bible says. And what's interesting to note is you don't need those theological nomenclatures to know that's what happens. Because when you talk to someone who's gotten saved, they may not know their Bible, they may not know all these theological phrases, but they'll use words like, I just feel like I'm new. I feel like, like a new being. I feel like I've been like reborn. I feel like I'm just like, I've, I've been born again. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a new creation. They'll use all these phrases, and then I chuckle and go, that's actually very theologically sophisticated. You're exactly right. They're trying to explain to themselves or other people, like, what has happened? In fact, I had a conversation with a woman last week here at our church, and her and her husband had, had gone through a very difficult situation in their marriage, and they had not been walking with Jesus, not going to church. I wasn't part of their thing, and, and, and kids were growing, and and, uh, and they had a, a significant uh, a sin enter their marriage, and it devastating, and, and they were trying to work through that, and, and kind of like last-ditch scenario, they're like, well, let's try going to church. 
And so he's like, I don't want to go. I don't want to see anybody I know. And they're like, well, there's this church. I heard they're doing this huge event at the Talent Toyota Center, and you'll, you, you won't know anybody. It'll be huge. You can just disappear in the crowd, and we'll go try it. And so last ditch effort, they show up at the Talent Toyota Center where this crazy church in town thought it'd be a wild idea to, to do Easter at the Talent Toyota Center three years ago. And so they show up. They sit in the back, and, and they watch Gary and Janet Searle's story. Remember that story? That powerful story of God restoring the brokenness of their marriage and they watch that story, and that story is reflecting their story they're in the middle of. And then I get up, and I go, hey, if you want to meet Jesus, why don't you go ahead and stand up? And she says, she describes this to me last week. She says, I'm sitting there, and we're holding hands, which we didn't do often. And all of a sudden, his hand goes. And I thought, dear Lord, <laughs> he must be going to the bathroom. I mean, not right there, like, you know, leaving to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Sorry, I need to clarify that. It's just G-rated sermon here. And, uh. And, and she's like, what in the world? And, and, and he, he said, as he describes it, he said it was like someone reached down, grabbed me by the collar, and just stood me up. And he walked out, and he ran into this guy who knows nothing about marriage called Greg McPherson, and, and Greg just stumbled his way through, <laughs> helping this guy out, introduced him to Jesus, gets baptized in the frigid ice water, if you were, we were called. Remember the ice water there? If you don't get baptized, you didn't know this, but we had set the tanks out on the ice the night before, thinking, this is great, we'll be all prepared. What we didn't know was the, the, the membrane they put down on the ice has no insulation. And so the, 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 the horse troughs that we sat, sat on that refrigerated ice all night long, it was about, you know, 17 below zero in, in, in the baptism, and we baptized some Navy SEAL Christians that morning. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I remember putting Gina Kelly in the water, and she's, she's, going, and, and she's going like this, and I'm thinking, she's having a, a, an encounter with the Spirit of God. She's, <laughs> God's just filling her right now, and she's, and, she's, and, and she's like this, and I said, Gina, I said, how you doing? And I'm thinking she's going to be like, I feel so full of the Holy Ghost, and she goes, I can't feel anything, and I'm like, oh, man, that wasn't the Spirit, that was the ice water. Okay, let's get her to win. So we did her, and then, and then she lost three toes, hypothermia. No, I'm kidding. It was very cool. Anyways, the point being, he gets baptized, meets Jesus, never been the same. Never been the same. And she tells me last week, she, she, she said, I always heard the phrase born again. It was like this empty, cliche, throwaway phrase until I saw what Jesus did in his life. And now i got a face and a name to put with that phrase. Oh, that's what it means to be born again. It means you're completely, totally, utterly, and forever changed. I believe in being born again, she said. Amen. Because God gives you new desires. Look at the text. As a result of being born again, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Which means when you come to Jesus, you can leave the empty life of sin. And I'm not going to get on my, on, on my soapbox here because, because I don't want to you know, offend too many people at at Christmas time. Well, I will. So this is what I just get so sick and tired of hearing in our increasingly victim culture. Everyone's a victim of something, whether it's racial this or color that or job this or socioeconomic that or the referee that made the kid cut his hair for the wrestling match this week because he couldn't wear long hair and now the referee's assaulting the kid. And I'm like, no, no, no. The rules say you got to have your hair cut or you can't play. Shocker that the referee would enforce the rules and now the ref's on suspension and the kid's a hero. And I'm like, what the ha? That stuff drives me crazy. Now, what, what's the point I'm making? We're living in an increasingly victim culture where all you gotta do is claim somebody hurt you or you didn't get a little red wagon when you were a kid or whatever it may be, and all of a sudden you're like a superstar, to which I say baloney. If anybody could claim being a victim, it would be the Christians who are being actively persecuted for their faith that Peter's writing to, and the one thing he does not do is coddle them. Oh, they, they made fun of you for being a Christian? Oh, well, come right over here. Let's get you a pillow and a binky. It's not what he says. He's like, suck it up, look to Jesus, persevere. Stand fast. Which means when you come to Jesus, you're freed from being a victim ever again to anybody or anything. You are now rather a victor over sin, not a victim to sin. Amen? And I, what I'm concerned is, as we take this victim mentality in life, oh, my mom did this, my dad that, and I, I don't want to downplay. I want to be careful, and I probably already hurt some folks. I don't mean to downplay sin done against you, harm done to you as a child. Those things are, are devastating emotionally, devastating 
relationally, devastating psychologically, mentally. I understand that. That is a travesty. God has made war against that sin through Jesus, and he will make sure that sin done against you will come to justice one day in Jesus. You can rest assured in that. And so there is no downplaying of that at all, and, and, and the, the relational and emotional ramifications of that for the rest of your life. I get that yes and amen. So having said that, what I never want to do is create a culture where we're just making each other feel good about all of our shortcomings and sin because we think there's no way, way, to, way to walk in victory. And I'm not saying, and Peter's not saying that you'll walk a perfect road of victory every step, winning every battle. No, you'll trip, you'll stumble, you'll fall. John would say if you don't acknowledge there is sin in you that you deceive yourself, we get it. But sinner is no, no longer the fundamental identity we stand on or draw from. Follower of Jesus, son of God, daughter of God, newborn, new creation, that becomes the now fundamental identity we live from, we draw strength from, we stand fast on in the face of sin, amen? Which means in following Jesus, you're given new desires, your wanter is changed. Doesn't mean that you never sin, but what it means is underneath the sin, it's not what you wanted, it's like, ah, I don't want that anymore. Apart from Jesus, all you can want is the empty life of sin. That's all you want. When Jesus enters your life, now the wants are changed, the desires change, the dreams change, the aspirations change. You don't want to give money away before Jesus unless it's to make yourself feel you know, less guilty about how selfish you really are. And then you come to Jesus and you're, and you're like, here, like this is, this is his, it's, it's, you know, it's, now it's yours, this is great. I'm just a conduit through which he gives and blesses people in the world. Everything changes. You can leave the empty life of sin. Look what he says. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable adultery. I love Peter's just kind of casual acknowledgement that that's, that's what you used to do. He's like, yeah, I used to be a drunken, orgy fest, rank, idolater, debauchery, pleasing, pursuing, yucky, pagan, poo-poo person. He's like, that was you over there. And he's like, but now you're new. What's the inference? The church is a place that's safe for sinners. There's no bar, you know. I one time had a guy ask me, can I come to Grace City? I said, absolutely. He said, do I have to like buy tickets or something? I said, no, it's free. He's like, that's cool. Why is it free? Because salvation is free. We're not gonna charge people to come to church on Sundays when Jesus says you can get to heaven for free. It's kind of weird. We'll charge you for a Christmas Eve service, you know. <laughs> That's for a good cause, you know. <laughs> I forgot the point I was making. I'm just... <laughs> Letting a somber silence settle over the room while I remember what the heck I was trying to gonna say. Here we go. What was it say? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Church is a safe place for sinners. So if you're here like, like, well, look at all these people got their act together. As you're looking around the room, give me five minutes and I will change. I was like, I could go around the we do not have our act together. I'll tell you stories, and you'd be like, whoa, you, you might want to I want to come back. This place is messed up. A safe place for broken people to explore. Knowing, loving, following, discovering, experiencing the healing power of God the Father through his son Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus, you just get new desires. You can leave the empty life of sin. And what I love about Grace City Church is there are so many stories I continue hearing more of. It's like, and it's the before, the before and after story, right? It's the, well, before Jesus, and I'm telling you, there are some wild stories in this room. I'm okay, I mean like badges of gospel honor. You know, it's like, wow, you used to do what? And then I met Jesus and I didn't want to do that anymore because the empty life of sin, I saw for the first time as it really was. It's, it's empty, it's hollow, it's lifeless, it's life taking, not life giving. When you come to Jesus, you get new desires, which means you're not a victim to sin anymore, you're actually a victor over sin. Number two, you get new friends. You get new friends. You get new desires. You get new friends. Look at verse four. 
They, now the pronoun for they is the friends, those who are still doing the, living a life of sin, they are surprised that you do not join them in their recklessness, their wild living, and they heap abuse on you. So here, here's a picture. There's those followers of, of Jesus in, in, that Peter's writing to, and they used to be living this wild life of drunken orgy and, and, and idolatrous sin. They meet Jesus. They get saved out of that into now walking in newness of life. They're living out the reality of the new birth, not perfectly, but, but daily. And their friends are going, what are you doing? We're over here having fun, and you're over there like, you know, all of a sudden you're a one-woman man? How much fun is that? All of a sudden, like, you, you don't let alcohol determine, you know, the party? Like, what fun is that? And they're, and, and they're heaping social abuse on the followers of Jesus, trying to suck them back in to the way of death they're currently in. Because here's what will happen, is oftentimes, I've found as I listen, is, is your, your new life of righteousness and the light that's radiating out of your life because of Jesus now begins making them aware of the darkness they're living in and guilt starts to enter in and shame and they're like hey like you know like in the like someone like hit the light switch in the early morning you're like ah turn off the light and now all of a sudden they're heaping abuse on you because at the core the one they're following hates the one you're following and so abuse comes, and, and many of you have the story. I came to Jesus, and it was instant abuse from the ones I thought were my friends, which means they really aren't your friends, are they? Interesting to note, I was talking with a, a, a kid here in our church, a dear young man, is a good friend of mine, and, and he was he's struggling with some, with some stuff in his, in his, going on in his life. And, and I, I said, that doesn't sound like, like you. Like, well, where'd that start? Well, I was at these parties. Okay, and who was it? Well, they were there. And, and, and he starts describing the kind of pressure that's a reality for our youth today to do this stuff or look at this stuff or smoke this stuff or drink this stuff or do whatever. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, right? Every, you know, all, it's the same stuff that you as adults went through. Peer pressure from the world to join in, in, in the recklessness of, uh, of the world. And he's, as he's describing this experience, he said, I don't even like doing these things. It doesn't taste good. I don't enjoy it. I just do it because they expect me to. I said, I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody at this party? He's like, not really. I said, do they know you? He's like, not really. I said, do you like them? He's like, not really. I said, do they like you? He's like, not really. I said, do you love them? He's like, no. I said, do they love you? He's like, no. I was like, then why are we listening to him? He's like, I don't know either. It's the craziest thing that we would let people that we hardly know who don't know us and don't love us determine what we do. It's absolutely asinine and all of us have done it. And the gospel frees us with new desires to get a new set of friends. I put it here, you can leave the dead end march of the fool's parade. Coming to Jesus gives you permission to step out of the mad march of the fool's parade. And I'm not saying that, that we make fun of the world or we ridicule the world, but I am saying the man who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Oftentimes, sin and friends go hand in hand. And in following Jesus, you might need to get a new set of friends. Not that you abandon your old friends and, and, and because you're better than them, but you disconnect from them because they're trying to drag you back into the pit of sin. And it doesn't mean you stop praying for them or loving them or inviting them into your new world but you know, well, if you go back into that world as, as a friend, you'll get sucked into the, the, the sin that, that they follow as well. And so what the gospel does is it not only gives you new desires, it gives you new friends. You are invited into a new family. You have a new family of brothers and sisters who love you, who want to pray with you, who want to walk with you, who want to grieve with you and laugh with you and celebrate with you and learn with you and fail with you and grow with you together. That's something you could never have in the world. We have someone in our community group that has, is new to, new to Jesus and, and new to faith and, and got baptized this year, and, and they said, you know what, is, you know what is, is, is the most stark contrast for me? And these are my words of them saying this, my paraphrase. You know the most stark contrast, this whole Christian ex thing we're into, is the friends that come with it. I, we didn't realize how shallow our friendships were until we got real friends in Christ where we actually talk about stuff that matters and get together every week and laugh without the, the, the fuel of alcohol. And ha like some of the funnest parties I've been to have been the parties we've thrown together and I remember the next day, which is so cool. <laughs> and we talk about meaningful stuff and we're vulnerable. And we, he's like, I would never be vulnerable with my other friends. 
Because it's all about competition. It's all about who's got the biggest this and can throw the furthest that and spit the farthest whatever and shoot the biggest whatever and buy it and leverage and blah, blah, blah. He's like, all that's gone now. He's like, it's just real, genuine friends that care about me. He's like, this, this, this is kind of blowing my mind. When you come to faith in Jesus, you get new desires internally and you get new friends externally to help you live out those new desires, amen? That gives you the power to leave the dead end march of the fool's parade. How many of you right now are marching the fool's parade. Well, and here's a missionary. Well, you're allowed, you're, you're undercover. You're, 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 wow, very stealth, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you're like, well, I'm here as, 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 as an undercover missionary. There's no, there's no teaching on undercover missionaries. You know, there's no clandestine gospel operations where I'm just gonna act like the bad guy and then, pow, I'll jump out and I'll be a good guy. No, that doesn't happen. You, you wear Jesus on your sleeve, you wave the flag, and, and, and you live loud and proud for him, and let the chips fall where they may. So how many of you are in the fool's parade and need to step out of it? Your, your, your job this Christmas is to make a few hard phone calls and say, hey, you know what, I love you guys, and, and, and I hope the best for you, but I can't keep hanging out with you and doing these things because it's destroying me. So I'm going to step out of that, I'm going to go this way. I would love for you to come with me. Let's, let's, let's go this way. And then you'll see who your friends are. The gospel gives you new desires, gives you new friends. Thirdly, it gives you a new judge. It gives you a new judge. And if you're here a follower of Jesus, this is exciting. This is very exciting. If you're here not a follower of Jesus, this is the part where Christmas gets a little dark. <laughs> here we go. Uh, verse five, but they, those friends who are like, hey man, come over here, let's go hang with some chicks and drink some booze, man. But they will have to give an account to him, that's God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. It may be fun for a while, what they're doing, and then judgment day comes and no more fun because all of us will have to live to give an account. Look at what he says later in verse seven. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind. So it raises the, the sanity issue. In a comic strip or a cartoon, who walks around saying, the end is near, the end is near? Some crazy lunatic, right? And yet the Bible tells us that the more clear-minded we become, the more crystallized the vision of the end be becomes. The fog lifts, the static gets off the line. Peter's urging us here to live realistically in light of objective truth, which is there is a God, there is a creator, there are moral, there are objective moral standards that we're called to live to that if we fail, we'll be judged because all of us love justice, right? We hate injustice, you know, just cause. It's wrong, I've been wrong. All of us somewhere, somehow have, have fired up the, the justice juices in our life when someone hurts us or wrongs us until we realize that, hey, if I demand justice for them and I want to be consistent, I should probably demand justice for my sin, and that means I'm, uh, okay, let's back this train up. So I said, the gospel not only gives you new desires, new friends, it gives you a new judge, which means you can drive with your eyes open. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm, I'm ripping it off from a C.S. Lewis quote, and he's, un, he's arguing for the nature of objective truth. Okay? Imagine there was, there, was, there was relative morality in the 40s. Can you believe that? And he's arguing for the reality of objective truth, a truth standard that exists outside of ourselves set by someone who rules and reigns over everything, namely God, and here's what he says. If the truth is objective, which he's arguing it is, if we live in a world we did not create and cannot change merely by thinking, if the world is not really a dream of our own, then the most destructive belief we could possibly believe will be the denial of this primary fact. In other words, if there are moral absolutes and we don't care to discover them, it would be like closing your eyes while driving. <laughs> What's he saying? If there is objective truth, set by a creator and we pretend that there are no objective truths and there is no creator and just run through life doing whatever willy-nilly we think is, is right, it would be like driving with your eyes closed. In other words, it would be insanity. It would be absolute insanity to live your life as if 
there was no reckoning coming. coming. And if there is a reckoning coming, then the very definition of sanity would be to live as if there is one. It, it would be like embezzling money from a company, okay? Let's just, we could all agree like that shouldn't be done and like that's not the best way to live your life now, so let's not put that on our Christmas to-do list this year. But it would be doubly insane if you embezzled money from the company a week before that company was gonna be audited. Would you agree? The accountant is coming and he's going to check the records and take account of all that has come in and gone out. So if you're gonna embezzle money from the company, do it at a time other than right before the accountant comes to do the books. And Peter's saying, all of your life is lived the week before the accountant shows to square the books. So to live your life with any other orientation, with your money or your time or your family, is insane. Isn't it funny that the world postures people who say, the end is coming, the end is coming, as the insane ones, and yet Peter says, if you live with that kind of perspective, that's the definition of sanity, gospel sanity. One of the things the gospel does is it wakes us up to ultimate reality like God and love and holiness and sin and repentance and judgment. And so when you get Christ, you get a new judge. Before Christ, your judge is the world, your judge is your friends, your judge is your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your soccer team, your judge is a star on TV you follow, your judge is the own inner murmur of your confused voice, or whatever it may be, and you live up to the standard that that judge sets for you. Whatever your friends say you should do, whatever your buddies think is cool, whatever you think will be done, you know, you know whatever thing you can do to make others like you, they become your judge. And, and just let me tell you, friends, living for any other judge than the one holy God is an exhausting way to live. Because they're arbitrary judges who are constantly moving the goalpost and, and, and shifting the targets and changing the standards so that you can never live up to it. Let me offer you the one true holy judge. And you think, well, how is that good news? I could never live up to his standards exactly. But here's why it's good news. It's because that judge stepped out from his chair, came around, and took your sentence for you in his son, Jesus Christ. So you no longer need to live up to the judge's standard of perfection. You need to look to Jesus who has lived it for you, which makes the life of Jesus just as important as his death and resurrection, amen? We were talking last week, I think I mentioned this in my, in, about our community group, and they were, they were like, I get the death and resurrection, but what's the purpose of his life? Aha, to live the perfect life that you never lived so that both his righteousness can be made yours and his death be credited to you, which is why I said a few weeks ago, heaven must be earned, and a bunch of you sent me emails, that's not right, it's free grace. Keep reading the Bibles, folks. Heaven must be earned. It's not enough to just have a zero balance in your credit. You must have enough to purchase heaven, like going to Disneyland. You can't go up to the front door and go, hey, I got no debt. They're like, they're like ducky for you. Still cost $9 million to get in here. So too is heaven. Earned through righteousness. The double transfer, Luther said. Our sin goes to Jesus. His righteousness gets credited to us. It's a, tr it's a double transaction. Positionally, we're righteous before God in Christ. Functionally, we're still working it out, but there will be a day. There will be a day where we'll be given the new creation bodies, and we will know perfect righteousness in his perfect presence forever, and oh, friend, that'll be a day you will not want to miss. You want to exchange the worldly judges for the new judge and then you want Jesus Christ to stand in your place, in your stead, as your advocate before that new judge. That happens when you confess your sins and you place your faith in Jesus. This has a, an extraordinary relieving effect on the follower of Jesus. Whew. I don't have to live up to the arbitrary shifting sands and standards of my friends. I look to the one true God and live for him alone. Live for the will of God. Next, you get a new relational MO. MO stands for, I don't know what it stands for. Modus operandi, that's a French word. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's all Spanish to me, no. Um, 
a new modus operandi, a new relational IQ, a new way to do life. Which means you can be a life-giving person. Apart from Jesus, my guess is you aren't nearly as life-giving as you think. Because your fundamental orientation is self. When you come to Jesus, it gives you a new center. It replaces self with Jesus. Jesus is now the center of gravity of your life. Jesus is now at the core. You live for him, and the first thing he tells you to do is to love him above all other people, and then secondly, to love other people above yourself. You are given a new capacity to live out your relationships, and this is what I often say about the church. What the church brings to the conversation of the culture that's unique is a relational IQ above all else. We should be the ones that have the best relationships. We should be the best spouses and the best kids and the best friends and the best employees and the best employers. And is it always the case? Of course not because of sin, I get it. But the idea is, as we follow Jesus, walk in the power of his gentle spirit, living out his character and his qualities, living to please him and, and to love him. And as we're standing on the the principles of God and the precepts of his word, it brings a kind of stabilizing factor to our relationships that you can find nowhere else in the world. They talk about intellectual IQ and emotional IQ. How about relational IQ? Because you know, all of life is relational. I have the great joy and privilege of, of, of having lots of buddies who own businesses and work in and the one The one unifying factor in all of their businesses, no matter how different they are in the trades, and the fields, whatever, is the challenge of their business comes primarily through people. Which means all of life is relational. If you get relationships right, everything else starts to line up. And in Christ, you get a new relational MO. It means you can be, maybe for the first time, a true life-giving person. I've met with people and, and, and they are, you know, I have, I have hard work ethic and this and that, whatever. Their family's shattered. They have no relationships with, with, with siblings or parents or kids, but they think they're doing fine because they got money in the bank. Nobody at the end of their life ever said, man, I wish I had more money in the bank. But when you live on the edge of death in your deathbed, you reflect on relationships. You go, hmm, those are what matter. So here's, here's the, 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 the relational IQ that increases in following Jesus. Look what he says, verse seven. The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. First thing that looking to Jesus does is it gives you a new desire to pray. Pray for yourself and for help. Pray for others and for healing. It gives you an outward orientation. See, the world says go inward. You know, look to yourself for answers. The Bible says don't look to yourself for answers. Look at yourself. Look at your life. How's it working for you? Exactly. Let's try something else. Don't look inward to yourself. Look outward to Jesus. And when you do that, it's going to cause something to rise in you, namely a desire to be in relationship with him, which means you, need, which means you pray. And it, it means it gives you a love for other people so that you lift their needs and their cares to the Lord as well. We're going to kick the year off, 21 days of prayer. Why? Because prayer moves the hand of God. Because prayer changes you. Because prayer connects us to the life source and the power source of God's spirit. A prayerless people don't experience spirit-born revival. We want revival in our hearts. We want revival at Grace City. We want revival in our community, which means we are going to pray. There has never been a move of God that was not fueled by earnest, consistent prayer. So we strike that note every year. We go into the fall, 21 days of prayer, where we equip you to be praying daily for yourself, for our church, and for our community. And that's what we're doing this year. We're going to start January 2nd or 3rd, somewhere in there. We're going to pray. Be sober-minded so you can pray. The first thing that this new relational um, uh, IQ gives you is a love for others so that you want to pray. Secondly, look at verse 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. So if we're praying earnestly, then we're loving deeply. I like what he says here about love. It's interesting. The kind of love that, that, that God stirs up in your heart is not just the kind of love that's helpful during peacetime. It's the kind of love that's useful during wartime. 
Meaning, it's not the kind of love that you just dish out to those who are nice to you. It's the kind of love you are able to engage even with those who are harsh towards you. So picture someone who has hurt you or wronged you, okay, and the world's response is, crush them, or catch them, or expose them. And the gospel response, empowered by the Spirit, is to cover them. Now, 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 now not cover up sin like, oh, my husband's an axe murderer, and I just, I'll just cover that up. <laughs> no, you need to turn him in. It's the kind of, sin, it's the kind of love that says, you hurt me, and, and, and my justice piece is firing and telling me I have the right to hurt you back, but you know what? In Jesus, I'm going to cover that up. I'm going to forego my preconceived, self-conceived right to shoot back. And I'm going to trust you to Jesus. Shocking how rough relationships get when you choose not to cover up, but rather dig up. If you're a digger, okay, if you're an exposer, Here's, here's my projection on your life. Not a whole lot of warm, fuzzy relationships around you. Because you're constantly, well, you know, I mean, remember that one time? You know, I mean, need I even say it? I mean, I've forgiven you and everything because, I, because God said I had to. <laughs> but really, that was, that was unbelievable what you did. If you're bringing it up, newsflash, you have not forgiven them. So stop giving yourself credit for being this varsity Christian when in reality, you're a death-bringing, life-sucking poser who's dragging someone else down by being harder on them than Jesus is who's already forgiven them. Can you see the nature? The, 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 The the death-bringing nature of someone who does not know how to love with a love that covers over sin. Not making excuse for sin or defending sin. I'm, Mary, I'm not saying that. If, you're, if you're, you know someone who's hurting someone, my goodness, you need to turn them in. But I'm talking about the relational stuff, the snarky stuff. Love each other deeply, Paul, or Peter says, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Next, relational IQ. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Offer hospitality. The missing jewel in the church, Alexander Strzok wrote, is the, the jewel, the gift of hospitality. Hosting people graciously. I texted Adam. I said, Adam, you got any off the top of your head stories of salvation recently that had hospitality as a piece of their journey? And, and, and my phone, ping, 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 ping. And I, and I kind of chuckled. I was like, I guess all of them. <laughs> Because hospitality is one of the ways that we extend God's love to those who are far from it. We invite them into our homes. As I'm looking out here and seeing faces, there are many of you who are, who are just geniuses at this. And your life has been marked by a life of hospitality. It'll be sacrificial. It'll be hard. You'll need to budget time for it, budget money for it, and budget carpet cleaning expenses for it. And people are going to spill stuff. I've been in some people's homes, and they're like, come on in. The Lord bless you and keep you. Don't touch that! I'm like, <laughs> and our kids walk around like this. That's no fun. That's not being hospitable. That's not what God did in his home. He's like, hey, come on in. Don't touch that. Don't God says, come on in. Make yourself at home. What's mine is yours. That's what Jesus said, right? My righteousness is yours. My death can be yours. My resurrection can be yours. My new creation, new heavens, new earth can be yours. The gospel is the definition of hospitality. What's mine is yours. And God says, now take what's mine I'm giving you and say it's yours to anyone who, who is in your life. So your home is not your home. Your car is not your car. Your time is not your time. I remember my, my buddy Dave Rasmussen in college. I didn't have a car down there. I said, hey, I said, hey can, I, can I buy your car? He's like, yeah, buddy. Boom, toss me the keys. He's, he's, he's like, it's not mine. I said, whose is it? He he said, 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 the Lord let me borrow it. You can have it. And I was like, you're going to let a college kid take your car home for a six-hour drive? And he's like, yeah, it's not mine. The fundamental posture of the believer is one that asks, what has God given me and how can I share it? Which is what city groups are all about. 
Scripture about, about gathering together in church homes, opening up home, eating good food, drinking good drink, enjoying whatever gifts God's given, and then inviting people into that world. That's what building home, that's what building home is about. Building home is, is about us increasing our ability to be hospitable to our community. It's tough to be hospitable in a rented apartment where you can't throw parties like you want to. I mean, the greatest gift of being in our new home is to throw parties because we can have people over. We built our home to be hospitable. Modern architecture does not get this command. Modern architecture is built around separatism, siloed individual living that does not expect to have anybody over. Okay, so Sharon and I looked through probably 300 set of house plans when we were building houses. Finally, we scrapped all of them. We, des- we designed our own floor plan. Because all of them, you know, you look at, it, at a 2,000 square foot house. 1,895 feet of that house in most new houses is like the master bedroom closet, you know? <laughs> of which I spend no time in. And there's huge bedrooms and huge garages, so the, the, the closets, you know, take care of all of our f- clothes fetish idolatries, and then the garage takes care of all of our vehicle idolatries, and then the, the you know, the, the movie room takes care of our entertainment idolatry, and then the, the family room where we host is like, you know, a postage stamp. Because after we feed all of our I- idols, there's no time for anybody else. And we're like, scrap that, the smallest rooms in our house are the bathrooms and the bedrooms. We want big kitchen, big family, big living room. Because we want to have people over. And with building home, building home is, is about increasing our ability to invite the community in to experience the love of God. Are you hospitable? Is your home open? Is your life, if you don't know how to be hospitable, Terry, wave your hand. Wave your hand, Terry. Your pastor says to you. Higher, higher. Okay, there we go. Terry loves it when I do that. Go talk to Terry. Terry and Nancy get hospitality. They understand hospitality. They've lost count, my guess would be, of how many people they've seen come to Jesus or get closer to Jesus because of good pizza and good food and a good fireplace. Amen? We open up our Bibles to learn about Jesus, and then we open up our lives to share the love of Jesus with other people. And Peter says, don't be grumbling when you're doing it. Yeah, welcome to our house. Take your shoes off, my goodness sakes. Clean carpet doesn't grow on trees. Don't do that. Come on in. Spill some. Ah, that's okay. Now, I'll be honest. When you build your house, that's a little harder to do. You're like, yeah, spill. That's no. Ah. <laughs> Open your lives. Invite people in. And then serve meaningfully. I've got to land the plane here. We've got to go. Look at verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Here's what he's saying. I've given everyone a gift and I want you to use it. And that gift is an expression of my grace to you to then be an expression of my grace to others through you. Now, this is how we do it at Grace City. This is how to be hospitable, okay? Take notes? Good, okay, right here. Here's how Grace City Church does church. We have grace teams, we have city groups, and we have church gatherings, okay? That's how we do what we do here at Grace City Church, okay? We gather as a church on weekends, and we, we throw parties together. We gather and worship and sing and learn and study and laugh and fellowship and praise Jesus together, spurring one another on towards love and good deeds, doing more together than we could on our own. We gather as a church. We, we get together in, in city groups where, where we're being the family of God and we're ex- living out the one another commands of the New Testament. And gifts are getting exercised there. We pray for each other. We, we study the word of God together. We laugh, we grieve, we cry, we walk with one another. And then we serve in grace teams. Grace City Church does teams, groups, and gatherings. That's how we do, psh, there it is right there. Like, like that's the elevator speech, you know? That's how we organize ourselves to fulfill the great commission in serving our community and following Jesus in our, in our town. And so we call it grace teams for several reasons. And it's this verse right here. Look at the text. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Which means every one of you have been given a gift or gifts 
that you won't find pleasure in experiencing fully until you're exercising them to serve other people in the church and in our community. And then he goes on. As faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Do you know that the word grace and the word gifts are the very same word? He's saying God's gifts to you are expressions of his grace, and when you exercise those gifts, they become the very expression of God's grace to you, to others. Grace teams, gift teams, where we're using the grace of God's gifts to us to serve other people, and we do it in teams because it's funner in teams than it is by yourself, amen? Grace teams. Well, we're exercising, do you know what your gifts are? Yeah, go, go to growth track. Adam's got an incredible, week two, week two, week two, incredibly helpful teaching, and then dive in. We have over 500 people serving on grace teams right now. Serving joyfully, sacrificially, exercising their gifts to bless our church family and serve our church community. And that's only going to grow when we get a new home where we can be more hospitable and to serve more people. Uh, I envision hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people serving on grace teams in the future to come at our new, at our new place, at our new home. More opportunities to give and to serve and to receive from God his gifts of grace and then give those grace gifts to others. Lastly, new power. We'll land a plane right here. You don't have to do the new you in, in the old strength. Look what he says at the very beginning. I skipped over it. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with this same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. What's he saying? To follow Jesus is to, is, 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 is to be done with sin and to open up your life to let people in. As Adam said to me this week. It's always got to rhyme with Adam. But you can't live the new life in the power of the old self. You live the new life fueled on the juice of new power. And where does that come? Look what he says. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body... Arm yourselves also with this same attitude. What's he saying? There is a way to weaponize the gospel so that you can wield it to fight the enemy, fight temptation, and fight sin. It does no good for you to have a weapon in your home if you can't get to it when the bad guys attack. Yeah, it's inside a, a locked case that's inside a locked case that's inside a locked case that's sunk in a concrete bunker that takes me 10 years to get to. It helps nobody. Weapons are only helpful and useful if they're in your hand, which means believing these arbitrary sets of facts about the gospel that are way out there do you no good in the fight of, of sin and temptation. You've got to bring them in, bring them close. You've got to wield them, handle them, smell them, taste them, love them. Use them. Get them close. And Peter says, how you do that is you, is you regularly meditate upon the gospel, which includes both the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which is why we so often take communion as much as we can when it allows for all the crazy stuff we have to do here to make church work on Sunday mornings. We want to regularly... Re Nobody who's meditating upon the death of Christ and savoring the price that was paid for grace to be free. No one meditating on that runs out and lives a life of rank, idolatrous, debauchery, drunkenness, and orgies. Nobody. Because here's what sin does, friend. Sin is not done in isolation apart from Christ. Sin is a spitting in the face of Christ. And so here's how you conquer the life of sin. You don't conquer sin by meditating on your sin. You conquer sin by meditating on Jesus. You don't conquer sin by always looking at it and, oh, it got me again. Man, how did it do that? Oh, what's over there? You walk away from sin by looking to Jesus. 
which is why we take communion and sing and open up the Word of God and exhort and preach and yell at you about Jesus. Look to Jesus. Meditate upon Jesus. Think about Jesus. See Jesus. Follow Jesus. Pray to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Love Jesus. Be about Jesus. Build 2019 on the bedrock cornerstone of Jesus. And the new desires, the new friends, the new judge, the new relational IQ, and the new power will increasingly be yours. And so, Father, I'm praying for these precious, precious folks that this very, very simple message would land in our hearts and stir us to love and good deeds that would awaken in our heart more love for you, more hope for our future because of you, that we would increasingly open our lives to love people, covering over sin, loving them deeply, praying for them earnestly, hosting people graciously, not just folks that can give us stuff in return, but stuff people that owe us nothing and can give us nothing, coming into our home, coming into our lives, where we increasingly say and ask the question, what is God giving me and how can I give it back? Father, would you increasingly reveal to this church family the gifts you've given them. Lord, this is my earnest prayer that not a gift would go wasted. Every man, woman, child in this place that you've given gifts to that they would, would not sit on the shelf or be ignored or be wasted, but they would wake up to what you've given them and how you've wired them and how you've gifted them in their place of employment and at their job and with students at the high school that they they teach or coach or with employees that they lead at their business or with an employer they're working for or with the kids they're caring for at home or wherever they may go. May you wake them up to the gifts you've given them and empower them to exercise those gifts in blessing others and loving others and serving other people that we might increasingly become as Grace City Church scatters from this place the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to our valley and beyond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.